So welcome and to everybody and thank you very much for being here. We don't have every night the Secretary of State in the Institute. So from this point of view, it's a, a special moment for us. And uh, while uh, uh, our rector is going to come and probably to tell you also welcome, much more institutionally, I just want to tell you that this is the end of a day which we started 11 in the morning, in which in a very small circle, we have been brainstorming some of the issues connected with the refugee crisis and particularly the European Union-Turkey deal. Uh, from this point of view, there are three persons who are going to be part of uh, these political salons we're organizing regularly with uh, the press, eh? which in a way, in a different way, none of three wants, needs an introduction. I'll start with uh, Mrs. Albright because yesterday uh, she told us a story which I do believe makes a good joke. When she became a Secretary of State and her partner was uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, Mr. Primakov, before it he was the head of the Foreign Intelligence. So when they met for the first time, he said, I do believe that in the age of Google, we are all Primakovs today. So we know everything about you, Madam Secretary. So we are not going to introduce you at all. Uh, what is important, and probably you don't know, that this is not the first time uh, uh, Mrs. Albright is here. 2003, she was in the Institute when she was basically presenting her memoirs. Gerald Knauss used to be a fellow in this place 20 years ago. But he's here not because he was a fellow 20 years ago, but because what we are calling today the Merkel plan concerning the relations between European Union and Turkey, to a great extent, was inspired and uh, pushed by a work that European Stability Initiative has been doing, uh, starting with September, basically. And from this point of view, coming from the think tank world, I should say that this is one of the very few cases in which you see an independent policy institute making such a dramatic impact on policy making. Normally, uh, think tanks were good at commenting on other people's ideas, not always having kind of a, uh, radical ideas of our own. I do believe that Gerald had this uh, tool. And being in Vienna, basically introducing Mr. Wuch and Depressa is going to be quite arrogant on my side. So from this point of view, I'm just going to give Shalini also to welcome you and we can start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ivan. Um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege as rector of the IWM to welcome uh, Secretary Albright. As Ivan said, this is your second visit to us, uh, the first time 2003 when you presented your memoirs here, and we hope this is not going to be the last. Uh, we would like to thank uh, especially uh, the um, uh, Presse for this uh, long cooperation to the political salon. Thank you very much, Mr. Ulch, for being here this evening. And, uh, Gerald, it's a particular pleasure to welcome former fellows back, especially successful fellows. Um, and therefore, uh, we are very, very happy to have you with us uh, this evening. I look forward to a wonderful discussion with both of you to begin with, and then we will open it to the audience as usual. Thank you very much for being here with us this evening. Uh, with, our, with some remarks on our topic, global responsibility and the refugee crisis, because it seems somehow to be um, a European problem, uh, and in fact, uh, it is a global problem. So maybe you can give us Id an idea of how the US uh, are seeing uh, this particular challenge. Well, thank you, and I am delighted to be here. No longer in the government, I will actually be able to answer them. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but let me say the issue of refugees is very close to my heart. I am a refugee. Um, we came to the United States in uh, 1948 after the communists took over Czechoslovakia. Uh, I don't have a terrible story because my father was a diplomat, but in the end, he defected, asked for political asylum, and um, we were there until I got my citizenship when I was uh, in college. And my father used to say on a regular basis when we arrived that people would say, 
I'm so sorry uh, that your country's been taken over by a terrible system. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you, and when will you become a citizen? And he said, that is what made America so different. Therefore, I am very troubled now that we are telling everybody what to do without, in fact, doing more ourselves at the moment on the refugee situation. And it is something that I have said publicly uh, in the United States, and I will continue to say that. Uh, and um, I fly over America very often. It's a very big country, and we have room. Uh, and so I do think that we have a responsibility to do something. I do think, and we have spent the afternoon talking about the various issues to do with the current refugee crisis, um, and there are an awful lot of questions, I think, that need to be answered. I have spent quite a lot of time in the last weeks with David Miliband, who is the former uh, British uh, Foreign Secretary, who is now in charge of the International Rescue Committee, talking about uh, all the things that need to be done. But the main thing that I come out with is, I think we make a mistake, even though it is an emergency. It is not something that can be taken care of quickly. I think these are issues that we are going to have to live with for quite some time. And therefore, there has to be a better system for how things are worked out. I generally am fairly critical in terms of what has happened to institutions uh, at the moment. Um, and um, I stole this line from somebody, but I use it so often now, is that what has happened is with the evolution of technology and globalization, this is what's happened. People are talking to their governments on 21st century technology, the governments hear them on 20th century technology and are providing 19th century responses. And therefore, there is no faith in institutions, whether they are the uh, national ones or the international ones. And so we are watching that, I think, in many of our countries where there are populations that are trying to get answers and are not sure that the governments are providing uh, the logical answers. And the refugee issue is certainly one of them. There clearly are incredible pressures out there, uh, more what I often call the international homeless of people all over the world trying to find where they can be welcome, who want to be able to live a decent, normal life. And while I think we'll talk about the institutional things here a little later, uh, I do try to think about it in the personal terms of putting yourself into the people's shoes that are, in fact, picking up their children and their one piece of luggage and walking uh, very far in order to get out of the horrors of Syria, particularly, and come to a place where they can have a normal life. I have spent time um, looking and going to refugee camps and seeing how people live there, and I think that what we need to do is put ourselves into everybody's shoes. I have said that a lot of the refugees are treated like dogs. The bottom line is in the United States, dogs are treated better. And so I do think we need to figure out what we can do uh, as an international community, which is that there is a co-responsibility for all of this, which is part of what we were talking about, and trying to figure out what the institutional structures are that can work with this. I think I spent a lot of time at the United Nations as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. I think that the um, while the U.N. Um, refugee commissioners have been trying to figure out what to do about it, I don't think the system has been particularly robust in doing it. Um, I always say this. I see a lot of friends in the audience, so they've heard me say this. I'm a European, just like you. I just happen to have been raised in the United States. Therefore, I think it's okay for me to criticize my people. Um, and I do think that um, I'm sad to see that the European Union also has not stepped up to the situation in terms of uh, how international uh, or, or regional organizations need to operate in a time when there's so many people uh, that need help. And I do think that one of the things we were doing this afternoon was we're not going to solve everything all at once, but it would be good to begin to look at a step-by-step -step basis where there are immediate things that can be done medium term and then a longer look. So I really look forward to um, spending time with all of you.
Thanks a lot, and good evening, by the way. Uh, uh, you have spent some time uh, this morning uh, in a workshop together with uh, Gerhard Knaus and others. Maybe, uh, Gerhard, you could give us uh, an overview of the state of affairs in the refugee crisis. You were, uh, as Ivan mentioned, very close uh, to the uh, establishing of the EU-Turkey agreement uh, on, on refugees. Uh, and what is the situation right now? How is it working? Well, thanks a lot, for first of all, for this opportunity. I want to really thank the center um, that they remembered me from 20 years ago. Um, it was a good time here. There's a very good kitchen below, and there are great books, and there's great company. Um, and so this evening fits in here. I mean, I really look forward to this debate in such great company. We had a few hours of discussion, um, and we focused on what actually today can be done in the very short term to preserve the principle of a liberal European attitude towards the refugee crisis. What we've seen last year, 2015, were some extraordinary numbers. To put it in context, in an average normal year from 2009 to 2013, all these five years since we have this data, the European Border Agency has found that around 100,000 people a year have crossed irregularly into the European Union. 100,000, more or less, in a year. Last year, 500,000 people crossed just to Lesbos, 800,000 people just to Greece. In a normal year, there are around 430,000 asylum applications in the whole EU, like 2013. Last year, it was 1.3 million. So this was an extraordinary year in the numbers. It was also an extraordinary year in the politics. What we saw in the last six months was a very sharp division, a big debate in Europe. And if you want to simplify it, on the one side, you have people like the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who essentially defined that movement as an invasion, a hostile takeover. And I'm not exaggerating. I, I just have a speech from him he gave a few weeks ago, on the 15th of March this year, where he said, he talked about the refugee movement, mass migration is uh, like a slow and steady current of water, which washes away the shore. It appears in the guise of humanitarian action, but its true nature is the occupation of territory, and their gain in territory is our loss. Now, this is the language of war, of territorial defense. Now, on the other hand, we had the position of other governments. Again, if you want to simplify, you have the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who have said, this is a crisis. We need to control our borders, but we need to do so in a way that is compatible with our values. We can't just shut Europe off. We need to move from a disorderly to an orderly movement. And that clash between Berlin and Budapest, where, of course, many other governments in the Europe took positions, it's going, I think, the way it ends, we're going to define what Europe will look like. For Viktor Orban, this is about the future of liberal values. He said it in a speech in September last year. He wants to see an end to the era of liberalism in Europe, by which he meant explicitly the commitment to universal human rights. Where are we today? We have a deal, which was fundamentally a deal reached by Angela Merkel. She reached it after talking a lot to the Turks. It was very controversial. Uh, in the end, what does this deal say? It has a central promise, which is that there should be, and again, just to be precise, there should be breaking the business model of smugglers and offering migrants an alternative to putting their lives at risk, an alternative to taking the boats and risking your life. So the deal has two parts. One, that you have asylum procedures on the Greek islands, which are in line with EU law and which determine who needs protection but which are also capable of sending those people who are safe in Turkey back to Turkey. So to this decrease the incentive to take a boat. Secondly, once, this, once there is a control to take back, that's part four of the plan, in a voluntary movement, large numbers of refugees, in substantial numbers, uh, in contingents, in resettlement from Turkey. So where are we today? Well, we have this deal, but the implementation is not going, not shouldn't make Europeans very proud. Right now, we have about 7,000 people on the Greek islands that are stuck, some of them in two detention centers. The number of people who cross has fallen radically, very fast. So that part worked, which should enable us to now do the other parts. One is to give everyone a fair chance for an interview, to establish whether they need protection, or to allow, uh, I mean, to, to give them an interview, to have interpreters, etc. 
you, you, we know roughly from asylum work that a caseworker can do seriously one interview a day. So we need 300 caseworkers on the Greek islands now to do 300 interviews a day. If they work 20 days a month, they can do 6,000 cases in a month. And in a few weeks, there's nobody who needs to be detained on these islands. But we don't have the caseworkers there. The EU has approached this in a very disorganized way. That's the first problem. We need a credible EU asylum support mission for Greece. Greece can't do it alone. Secondly, we need to get serious about resettlement. The deal is that if the numbers fall, and they have fallen dramatically in the last week, less than 50 a day, if the numbers fall, we have promised the Turks and we've promised the refugees we will take them as resettlement. This would be if it works, and the numbers discussed were 150 to 250,000. Uh, the biggest resettlement in the last few decades. But it needs to be done. It's politically difficult. It needs to be organized. And there is a danger that now that the numbers fall, politicians will again forget about it. Say, oh, well, the problem is solved. Let's forget this. The good thing is the Turks will remind us. And here they have a joint interest with human rights groups. Um, but, uh, but we should also remind our leaders. Now, if this works, and this is my last point, this deal would actually be a useful step for human rights. It would send a, mo a signal to the rest of the world. The Americans are, the US is actually the country that takes most refugees at the moment through resettlement in the world. Um, in the whole world, on average every year, less than 100,000 people are resettled. In the whole world, refugees, every year. If the EU does this, it can then turn around and work with Americans like Madeleine Albright to send a message that all of the rich countries in the world need to do more. There are lots of refugees in Lebanon, in Jordan. There is a, U a whole lost generation. But if Europe fails, if we don't implement this agreement fairly and, and with good faith, then uh, I think the whole refugee convention is a threat. If Germany, if Austria, if Sweden turn away, if we have Donald Trump set the debate in the US, I think we are in real trouble. Uh, Mrs. Albright, um, I think that the European Union could already turn uh, to the rest of the world and, and ask other countries to receive, uh, to welcome more refugees. Uh, you are regretting that, that uh, the U.S. haven't taken a lot. I guess there were less uh, asylum seekers uh, from Syria than, <coughs> than in Austria last year. So, so why is it uh, that uh, a country with a tradition of welcoming refugees like you doesn't open itself more in this particular situation? Well, first of all, I do think that people need to understand that the United States has a very generous uh, immigration policy, probably more than other countries, uh, and yet we are having also an immigration debate, uh, which is um, rather peculiar, if I may say so. You already mentioned Mr. Pr Mr. Trump and uh, about building walls and doing all kinds of things that seem totally anti-American to me. They are anti-American. And uh, our, one of our issues is that we are in a different hemisphere and that obviously a lot of the people <coughs> that are coming into the United States are coming from Latin America, and <clears throat> there are, um, which is kind of a normal movement, but we had some very difficult times <clears throat> this last year with children coming up uh, through Central America, children that had been sent without parents and trying to figure out what to do with them. And so I think it is important to explain some of the pressures that are there in the United States uh, that are different. But I think part of it is that um, I, I think that we believe that the U.S. has a role to play in this. I can't explain, frankly, why the numbers are as low as they are on the Syrian refugees, which is why I have made no bones about the fact that I keep saying we need to take more, mainly because we need to take more, but also it puts us in a very strange situation of lecturing other countries about what to do if we ourselves are not doing more. I do think the Europeans need to do more, but um, I think in order for the United States to tell people how to behave, we have to do more ourselves. Would you agree? There is also some, some moral responsibility the U.S. Uh, bears. Um, if you look 
uh, at, at, at ISIS, for instance, one could draw a direct line from the intervention in the Iraq to the creation of a group called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which transformed itself uh, into ISIS. What I wanted to say that that the U.S. bears part of the responsibility for the chaos, but I, I cannot see that this case is really made in the U.S. or or elsewhere, at least not in a strong way. Well, let me just say, I do a lot of different things in life, and one of them is I'm co-chairing a uh, task force with the Atlantic Council about how uh, we should be doing things in the Middle East. My co-chair on this is Stephen Hadley, who worked for President Bush, and we took a pledge not to talk about the past. I'm having a harder time keeping that. Um, he is. But I, I do think that the real problems... One of the things that, that's kind of strange to say, it's not easy to be the United States. Um, if we do nothing, we are criticized. If we do too much, we are criticized. Um, I do. I personally think that um, when I worked for President Clinton, we did a number of different things in the Balkans that I'm very proud of, that we were trying to deal with uh, people being moved around and ethnically cleansed, and I actually think we left things in pretty good shape when the other people took over. Uh, but the bottom line is that... Uh, there were two things that happened very early on in the Bush administration. One is 9-11 that really affected Americans. It's, it was, it's completely a watershed event in our history. And so I would felt very strongly that President Bush had every reason to go into Afghanistan because the people, the murderers that did 9-11 uh, came from Afghanistan. There were many questions about why the war in Iraq, and some of it, I think, can be blamed on what I call the fear factor. Uh, and I happen to believe that the war in Iraq was one of the greatest mistakes in American foreign policy. And it did do a lot of what you're talking about in terms of, um, you know, why was the war? Uh, we can spend a lot of time talking about that. But also, what happened when the Iraqi state was dismantled um, in terms of um, the infrastructure of the state and the military and various things, creating <clears throat> very much a vacuum. President Obama was elected to end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. That was the basis of many of the aspects of, of his election. Uh, I do think that um, not enough attention generally was paid as to how a group like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, Daesh as we call it, uh, came up. And one of the things that I spend an awful lot of time talking about, and I'd be delighted to, or I hope others will discuss this, is that it created a vacuum. And uh, what are the roots of ISIS? Uh, it is um, people that are dissatisfied, no economic dignity, um, trying to figure out how to deal with all the various dislocations in the Middle East, I don't think it's all America's responsibility. I think that uh, clearly there was an aspect of it that um, one is responsible for, but um, I spent a lot of time with <clears throat> Bashar al-Assad, the father, uh, who I often say called himself a lion but was a mule, in terms of his stubbornness. I met Hafez Assad, his son, uh, <clears throat> for whom I met him. Uh, very, I was America's representative to his father's funeral. And then, interestingly enough, at that stage, Crown Prince Abdullah, who became King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, wanted me to meet with younger Arabs. So he arranged a meeting for me with Hafez Assad. With, with Bashar. I'm sorry, with <laughs> Bashar Assad. And so what happened was... Um, this is an easy way to say it. We had an interesting conversation. For him, one and one made two, but two and two didn't make four. There's something really missing in his what thought. What did you talk with him about? Uh, trying to figure out what he thought he was going to do um, in Syria, because we had had very interesting discussions in terms of the Golan Heights and the position of Syria. I think he evolved into somebody who... Um, uh, believed that he had the right to get rid of people that he didn't like. That was not a discussion that we had 
at the time. And I think that he is the one that has created the most unbelievable chaos in Syria by killing his own people. Uh, whether with barrel bombs or with chemical weapons, and that the international community actually did and does have a responsibility for dealing when leaders kill their own people. So, If, if I might just add one thing. Uh, in your time as Secretary of State, there was a completely different uh, discourse. This was the time uh, when, when we talked about um, humanitarian interventions. Uh, when, when the idea of the responsibility to protect uh, was established. This seems to be uh, all gone now, maybe because of the uh, experiences in Iraq or in Libya. But uh, would it You'll have be been... You'll be so sorry you asked me this question. Why? <laughs> because it's my specialty. Ah. <laughs> uh, no, let me just say, because I am fascinated by the whole issue of international responsibility. I'm somebody, I love being at the United Nations at a time immediately after the end of the Cold War <clears throat> when Russia's behavior uh, changed and the first President Bush was able to put together a coalition of the willing to, to deal with um, um, you know, Saddam Hussein who deserved to be dealt with because he'd invaded Kuwait. And so, there was a different approach, and one of the things that I found interesting when I got there was how the whole peacekeeping operations worked. Mm. Peacekeeping was a major part of the UN when it started, but it started, uh, or it was used in a way where when there were agreements made, then the peacekeepers went in in order to keep the peace and keep the parties separated. What happened in the 90s, we began to look at places such as Somalia and Bosnia in terms of whether the peacekeepers could actually also help to be peacemakers and, and actually be on a side instead of being neutral. It's very interesting in terms of, uh, I went to visit every peacekeeping operation in the world because I was fascinated in how they worked. Uh, many of them were uh, mostly people from um, ver various countries that wanted their military to be paid for or I'd never forget being in Angola where there was a Uruguayan battalion and they told us they're there because their government preferred to have the military outside the country than inside the country. Uh, but a lot of, often, they were troops that had never been together, that didn't speak the same language, their uh, weapons were not interoperable, and so we began to work on ways to make the peacekeeping, peacemaker uh, um, situation uh, more orderly, have uh, the United Nations uh, understand the rules of engagement better and all that. So what then happened, the Canadians, who have been very good international citizens, Lloyd Axworthy, who was my uh, colleague, they came up with human security aspect, that the peacekeepers, peacemakers were supposed to worry about the people and not just the territory. Same. So then that evolved in this concept of responsibility to protect. Because we now have information on what happens everywhere, if the leader not only does not protect his own people but is killing them, then there is a General Assembly resolution that says the international community has a responsibility to protect. The problem is, and it came up in Libya, is what do you do? It's not supposed to do regime change. But if, in fact, the leader says his people are cockroaches and wants to kill them, then it's kind of automatic that you're talking about regime change. And there is not enough planning within the international community, and we can talk about that more, in order to deal with the follow-on to the military intervention. Well, the, the formula, responsibility to protect, would have fitted perfectly to Syria. Nevertheless, there was no uh, attempt to intervene or to set up uh, protection zones there. Why? Uh, I think <clears throat> because there was the genuine question as to what the United States, who would offer the mandate uh, to do it. What happened in Libya was the, the, uh, the French offered the United Nations mandate because the bottom line is you can't do R2P without a UN mandate. And I think that there was not a movement forward on that. And the United States, literally, there is no question the American people 
were tired from Afghanistan and Iraq. I think that is a statement of fact. That and the Russians would have blocked uh, any I am attempt. In usually, the I mean, they didn't vote. They abstained on the Libya mm. aspect. I think they would have blocked a Syrian one. Do you think, I mean, having worked in the Balkans for a few years, in the shadow of your policy, because I remember that time Americans were all over Bosnia working on refugee return, and it was quite remarkable to see the the distant Washington has so many special envoys coming to Bosnia and knew every village and saying, here, the Croats need to return to this town, Bugoino, and the Serbs to Durvar. There was a superpower that was really focusing on something as seemingly banal, but in the end crucial, as returning people who had been displaced. This kind of emphasis in the Balkan crisis, after the intervention, to stay on, to, to engage and to, to do these things. I always wonder, where, where uh, was this because there were people in the U.S. who had a particular memory of what had happened in Europe, like yourself, and, and cared uh, intensely in a way that perhaps people don't anymore today? Was there a confidence in U.S. power at that time that you could actually you know, do things in a place like Bosnia, which is missing today? Or was there something about the way we think about international morality that changed? I mean, in Syria, as you've just said, so many things we did in Bosnia, you know, weren't even attempted, you know, beginning from the diplomacy to trying to use international um, criminal um, investigations seriously. Uh, what is the difference? Because it's so striking, these two well, I, experiences. It's, what's very hard to explain is um, that there truly was a different mood after the end of the Cold War. And... I give a great deal of credit to the first President Bush, who talked about a Europe whole and free and thought that we should be doing more. What did happen, and one of the things that um, is an event one place affects something else, the first President Bush had done the Gulf War, and then what happened was people were tired of that. Secretary Baker and um, others thought that, that the U.S. didn't have, as we put it, a dog in the hunt in um, in the Balkans. For whatever reason, um, there really was an interest in what, we, what was going on in Bosnia. Some of it, I happen to believe that individuals actually do play a big role uh, in <clears throat> the foreign policy. There were people that understood better what was happening in the former Yugoslavia that wanted, that felt that we should do something. Richard Holbrook, uh, who had, um, uh, when he became Assistant Secretary for Europe, it made a very big difference. When I was at the, I, I don't want to, you know, one, I will describe this scene because it was so uh, stunning. It, it's a complete accident of history that I should have been at the United Nations at this particular time. My father was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia. It is one part of the world that I felt, I was a little girl, but that I felt very familiar with. Plus, I understand Serbo-Croatian and actually know where the cities are. So, uh, but what also happened was that at the UN at the time, uh, I, was, I saw more different diplomats than any other American diplomat because, you know, whoever was ambassador to Austria would see more Austrians. But the bottom line is I saw everybody, and they came up to me over and over again and said, why aren't you people doing something about Bosnia? These are terrible things that are going on. We talked about it at the United Nations all the time. And um, I wish Colin Powell were here, because we talk about this fairly frequently, and we're very good friends. What happened was that I would come down to Washington to talk about what we needed to do. And I had a sense that we did need to do something more about Bosnia. So I actually, in a meeting, a mere mortal female civilian decided to argue with the hero of the Western world, Colin Powell, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he was a brilliant briefer and could describe what we could do, uh, take any, you know, Mount Igman, but it would take X number of military and cost a lot of do dollars. And he ended the conversation by saying, and what are you going to tell Sergeant Slepchak's mother when he is dead as a result of having stepped on a landmine in Bosnia. So he'd lead us up the hill and drop us off the other side. And I said to him, Colin, what are you saving this military for? 
He got furious at me. He leaves. General Shalikashvili comes in. We begin to do uh, activities in Bosnia. Uh, Colin wrote a book. It always takes a while to get a book published. So by then, we had won in Bosnia. So I get a phone call from uh, a journalist who says, so what do you have to say about what Colin Powell said about you? I said, well, what did he say? He said I had to, that I practically gave him an aneurysm uh, and that he had to patiently explain that our soldiers were not toy soldiers. So I called him up and I said, Colin, patiently? And he said, yes, you didn't understand anything. Um, and then he wrote me a note. He sent me his book, and he wrote, with love, admiration, etc., and signed it, patiently, Colin. And then I wrote him back a thank you note and signed, love, admiration, etc., and I signed it, forcefully, Madeline. Uh, <laughs> But I really did believe and do believe that there are times that there is a possibility of the military doing limited action to free people that are being killed for no reason whatsoever beyond uh, who, you know, what their religion is. And so I did feel strongly about it, and, but so did a lot of other people in the government. But it was a different time. I think there really, there was not the weariness that has come from uh, Iraq. So, there is no question about the role. And then something that I talk about, which I call the Karzai effect. The United States and our NATO allies lost a lot of people in Afghanistan. Not only did he not thank us, but he said that we had screwed everything up. That makes it very hard to go and argue in a democracy with the people that we need to go do more in Syria. So, But what should have been or could have been done in, in Syria to, to end the bloodshed there? I think it might have been useful if at some point there really had been a decision to have an international, to have uh, um, NATO or um, other countries be in there, not the United States alone. I really do think that one can't ask the United... B believe me, having just come from the Middle East, there is, if you're the U.S., you're damned if you do or damned if you don't. Uh, it is a very difficult thing, and we are a democracy, and we, our people, really, I think, need to understand what our responsibilities are with others. President Clinton said it first, indispensable nation. I said it so often it became identified with me, but there is nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. It just means that we need to be engaged and we need partners. And I think that is where the discussion turns in terms of what do the Europeans do, what are NATO's responsibility, who are the other powers within the United Nations that can do things together. The U.S., American people are fascinating. We do know, want to be the world's policemen. We are not an imperial power. Uh, we are not a, we're a country that wants to control other countries. We want to have partners. Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables, and it ends in an <laughs> ism. But all it means is partnership, <laughs> and that's what we're looking for. Uh, it, it, you have been ambassador to the United Nations uh, for quite a while. And coming back to the, to the refugee crisis, I wonder why uh, the United Nations haven't been used as a platform uh, more strongly to coordinate uh, uh, support policies in this in this refugee crisis. I, mean I do too. I, I I really do wonder. I I don't know, if Gerald. Maybe you've got an answer. Well, I, if you look at UNHCR, for example, mm. um, I mean it has the resources it is given, and it has the it's preparing for what it expects it can do. So take resettlement of refugees. If countries don't offer places then UNHCR will not be able to place people. I know in Turkey, UNHCR has done lots of interviews over many years with refugees. But then it is very hard to find countries that take them after they are recognized yeah, as refugees. There a political process would be needed, maybe, to, 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 well, to rally the countries. And, and, and that's why uh, the United Nations were, were created, right? Well, I think partly, I, and I, that would lead mm. me to a question to you also, I think partly what we see, you refer to this vision of Europe, home and free based on liberal values, this idea that we, we are moving in a certain direction. History has a direction, and there will be more liberal democracies, and they will be spreading our values. And, uh, of course, Bosnia was an intervention, but it was almost seen as an aberration, an accident. Today, what we're seeing is that many of these values, 
that we expect the UN and others to uphold, including the Refugee Convention, are challenged in democracy. And I was wondering how you see this today in Europe, because this vision of Europe whole and free, and Europe without borders, and Europe of democracy spreading to the East, is today being challenged, not just tactically, but sometimes strategically, by leaders of some European nations, by strong parties, uh, as wrong. I mean, what we see is this new populist wave of anti-refugee, anti-Muslim, anti-European, anti-American, anti-liberal, often pro-Putin political forces in many countries. We can list the parties. W when you look at this, as somebody who's been involved with this vision, first, what do you think might have gone wrong? But secondly, do you think this is recognized in Washington? I mean, is America still enough engaged in Europe to worry <coughs> about what is happening politically yeah. today? Do you know what I <coughs> find interesting about all of us that have been in <coughs> involved in policy? that uh, we don't question our assumptions enough and are also not clear enough about the unintended consequences of decisions. So I was asked um, in, on the 60th anniversary of NATO to, um, what happened was there was a new Secretary General, Rasmussen, and the heads of state decided when they were in Strasbourg, Kiel, to create a group of experts that would talk about a new strategic concept for NATO. And what happened was I was named as the American expert. Then Rasmussen decided that 12 countries would only be members of this group of experts, automatically irritating 16 countries. And then he asked me to chair it. So we were looking at what NATO's role was going to be in as we move forward after the 60th anniversary. I find, and I only use this as an example in terms of how things changed. So... For instance, we were really talking about the fact that NATO was mostly going to be operating out of area. Uh, and we were looking at what the lessons were out of the Balkans and Afghanistan, and the fact that NATO actually had more partners than members in looking at what was going on in other parts of the world. Did anybody expect the Russians to illegally take a piece of Ukraine uh, and then try to figure out what, in fact, you know, what were the results of that? How would the international community react to it? And I think it wasn't so long ago, and all of a sudden, everything is different again. I, I am trying very hard not to say this, but I will say it, um, because I am very disappointed in the way that Central and East Europeans have been reacting uh, to the refugee crisis. We spent, we, all of us, spent an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to help those that were refugees from the communist system. Uh, and I remember watching TV as that horrible refrigerated uh, truck came into Austria. Uh, and there on American TV, there were pictures of buildings that had been set up for Hungarians that were escape had been trying to escape in 1956. I think Orban's behavior is disgusting. And I really do think that what has to happen is a sense that, in fact, we all are in this in a common way. I do wish I said, and I'll keep saying it, the U.S. needs to do more. But the Europeans, I think, really do need to do more. I know that there are questions about why the U.S., quote, rebalanced to Asia. The United States is not monogamous. We are an Atlantic and a Pacific power. And there was really the sense that, the, that, the, that Europe that where the European Union had begun to flourish would, in fact, be a partner you know, as we dealt with problems in other parts of the world. The European Union has had its set of problems and is not doing, I think, its share. The European countries are... They, people came to me because I'm theoretically... In every meeting in the United States, people say to me, so what are your people in Central Europe doing? So I am responsible for everybody's behavior. Uh, <laughs> but the bottom line is that people want, you know, why are you, why did you abandon us by going to Asia? I said, nobody abandoned you. You were the problem. You are now the solution. And I think that's part of what's happened is kind of a sense that America wanted Europe as a partner and all of a sudden, some of these problems are not being dealt with. And Ivan, you're the one, when we were just in, in Bratislava, basically there are opportunistic uh, politicians that are taking advantage 
see the, dis the horror of the refugee crisis as an opportunity to, to talk about liberal, please. Mm -hmm. um, I know that liberal in the US and uh, in Europe are different, the definition of it, but it does not mean deciding that you're not gonna deal with people that are different than you are and have a system where you close your borders and say to hell with the people mm. that are trying to get away from horrible things. But uh, you have criticized uh, Mr. Orban harshly and-, and He deserves and, it. And, and Central <laughs> European countries. But what, what, what kind I'm of- I'm not going to Hungary real soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of help is it to scold uh, those countries? Obviously they have, uh, they have their problems with uh, accepting foreigners, may because maybe because of their history. Uh, and it's, uh, I guess in the, in the whole discussion, it's not very um, useful to tell them that we're all uh, disappointed. So I think that um, diplomacy is uh, you try to work with countries, and I think that there have been a number of attempts to try to figure out how to get more cooperation. I think that Mr. Orban doesn't want to cooperate with anybody. And I think that sometimes, It is important, we call it in the United States, name and shame. And <clears throat> when uh, the behavior is unacceptable for a civilized society in the 21st century to decide that you are not going to deal with people who are different, uh, I think it is shameful. And he doesn't want to deal with us. Uh, he has done other things, I think, that make questionable his behavior in terms of how he treats the media and various laws and things. I mean, I, th I think he is taking a very high-handed um, approach to being in the middle of Europe uh, in terms of uh, how he behaves. I think it's regrettable. I really do. Mm. But one could also say that he was uh, avant-garde in a way because he was the first European leader Uh, who, who recognize that it is a problem, and you may call it populism, but obviously it is a problem for, for a lot of European uh, citizens that the borders uh, were open, and, and lots, tens of thousands of people came unregistered. So this made, f made very a lot of people feel very uneasy. Can you, can you understand that this caused political problems? I think that I am a child of Europe, uh, and I saw what, <coughs> or because I was too little, but basically what the issues are when uh, national identity uh, becomes the only thing where um, it's a way of hating the people that live next door. I do think that people want to have an identity, we all do, but it doesn't have to be based on disliking other people. So. That is one of the things that, that bothers me. I do think that what was supposed to be part of Schengen and of a European uh, Union was open borders. That's what the whole thing is about. And being able to travel freely and yeah. feeling as a European. And let me just tell you what I found interesting. In, in 1991, I was asked to do a survey of all of Europe Uh, in terms of <coughs> doing questionnaires and focus groups. And I traveled around, at that stage, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, uh, all over. And the number of people that said, we want to be normal Europeans. We don't want to be known as those who were, uh, you know, under communism. We want to be Europeans. And I think there is a responsibility to being a European in terms of having this capability of uh, not just being identified as a Hungarian or mm. uh, a Czech, but also in terms of understanding that there's a shared responsibility. And believe it or not, I met um, Viktor Orban in 1986. He had long hair. <coughs> He was uh, a, an activist in terms of trying to get rid of communism. Uh, he came to the United States, participated in many different Uh, activities and conferences. I don't know what happened to him. I really don't. And I think that if he sees himself as a leader, then I think he has to be careful about the kind of things he says. Now, 
I will again make the following point. The United States is also going mm. through a period of populism. I think populism is not a great way of seeing things in terms of um, you know, the lowest common denominator and based on disliking other people. The, the strength of America has been diversity. Uh, and, um, and I do think, I hope that our people remember that. I am appalled by some of the things that are being said in our campaign, absolutely appalled uh, in terms of walls and saying that Muslims aren't welcome and um, you know, kinds of things that I think are un-American. And so I'm hoping that we will have a president and she will fully understand <laughs> how it's supposed to work. Uh, Gerhard, I guess uh, Europeans are all in favor of open borders inside the European Union, but uh, uh, they have problems with the lack of control hmm. at the out outer border. Maybe that is what is being tried to do at the Turkish-Greece border. Right I, mean, I, I, think, I think it is uh, extremely important for politicians in democracies to have answers to the concerns of people that they lose control. I mean, what we saw in the last half year was not sustainable. I mean, this sense that there is a loss of all control at the borders, uh, it was clear that eventually there would be a backlash because it wasn't just about refugees coming. And they didn't come to Europe, they came mm. to a few countries. I mean, they came largely to Austria, Sweden, and Germany. So th it was always clear, and I don't think this was Viktor Orban's idea, it was always clear that there has to be a way to have some order, some structure, because that's what publics want everywhere. I mean, the worst example is Australia, where a few thousand people arrived in the early 90s, and Australia decided to have indefinite detention for anybody who comes by boat to seek asylum. Potentially unlimited in time. And then it found this Pacific island, Nauru, and puts people there. Australia was a co-writer of the Refugee Convention. So the question is, how do you avoid becoming Australia as Europe? How do you still control borders and keep the public? Because the public is afraid. I mean, the public wants to have answers, but I also think the public has compassion. What we saw in the last half year in Germany, Austria, Sweden, and other countries was that people were willing to accept genuine refugees. So this is, the, this is the challenge. And here, I think we were really lucky in the last half year with the leadership in Berlin, with Angela Merkel. Because what she actually did was from the start to say, look, we need to find a way to, yes, restore control, but don't do it by lowering our standards in our own countries, so to make it unattractive. It wouldn't work anyways for Germany, Austria, Sweden. Secondly, we need to work with the countries that are concerned, with Turkey and Greece. Turkey has most refugees in the world today. So we need to find a way that the number of people who come in <coughs> and apply for asylum and don't get it because they're not refugees, which is a lot, the majority, who didn't get asylum last year and the year before, is reduced, but the number of refugees that are taken in without risking their lives is increased. Now, we don't know if it will work. I mean, this is the idea of this deal that she negotiated with the Turks and the Greeks and the Dutch, but I think it is the, it is the only way we can go. We cannot have just open borders without control because we will see populist parties win everywhere. But we cannot just build Europe as a fortress. We are not Australia. And what Viktor Orban, that's my last point, what, what, where he's, he managed a great confidence trick. He said he, he protected the borders of Europe, but in fact he just directed people to other European countries. Mm. I mean, they just went to Slovakia and Austria, and Slovenia and, and, and Austria but and other countries. This was a very widespread tactic. Yeah, in, and, in and, then, and then he said, and I have another brilliant idea, let's build a wall north of Greece. Now the trouble of this was other countries that we know well followed this idea to cut off the Balkan route, which on its own is a disastrous strategy because it will just simply mean refugees get trapped in another part of the EU. So Greece becomes Nauru for Europe. So this is why it was so important that we have a deal which is imperfect, but which we need to implement. And without Angela Merkel's uh, and uh, Dutch presidency's persistence, we wouldn't have this deal. Now we need to implement it. And I think that is a good answer to the yeah. populists who, remember, Hungary doesn't, uh, didn't give asylum to very many people last year. I mean, basically nobody stayed nobody there. Nobody wanted to stay nobody there. Nobody wanted to stay there. And, uh, well, that is in itself telling. Yeah, yeah. I, w I would like to, to open up uh, this discussion and, and give you the chance uh, 
to ask questions. But before that, I would like to ask you, what is your general take on the European Union Union's handling uh, of this current crisis? What is, what is your perspective from, from Washington? Um, well, I, I keep, I'm going to keep saying the same thing, which is I think the U.S. needs to know where we are before mm. we criticize mm, everybody sure. else. I really, I want that as a lead motif that people really understand that I know that uh, we have problems ourselves. I think that I have been troubled generally about the fact the European Union was built on one leg, doesn't have a fiscal policy, went through the various issues. Uh, Greece has gotten a double whammy um, in so many different ways on this. The question of how Northern Europe behaves vis-a-vis -vis Southern Europe generally, and whether um, how the bureaucracy in Brussels really operates. I mean, very complicated. I don't think that there has been enough coordinated effort. And one of the things we were talking about this afternoon, I find really strange that in this world of technology that we can't find the 300 people uh, to go and do the um, interviews. Uh, the asylum interviews. The mm -hmm. asylum interviews. And that, in fact, we have computers and a variety of technical methods to do this. And whether it's a question of organization uh, or lack of will, it, it strikes me as passing strange. I do think that what needs to happen is to see whether there isn't, we talked about peacekeepers. Why isn't there a way that the international community can put together a core of technically competent people to be able to go and do this? It doesn't matter what countries they're from, but can, in fact, do the interviews. Uh, during the Balkan Wars, we were able to match up families as a result of uh, technological capabilities. I think we should do that and not just blame each other, but try to figure out what the, the mechanism is, the combination of UN um, uh, refugee commissioners and the EU, and try to figure out how to have you know, some kind of a a core that can do this, that's capable on behalf of the international and European community to um, help through the interviewing process. Gerrit, one question uh, concerning the Turkey-EU deal. Uh, how will uh, the EU and Turkey do the trick, uh, trick of distributing uh, refugees uh, after the number of 72,000 have reached. There is this one-on-one -on -one deal mm. for every uh, refugee which is sent back from Greece to Turkey. Uh, the European Union would take one uh, refugee directly. And after the numbers of, of ref refugees crossing illegally is substantially reduced, then EU, the EU is supposed uh, to take more in a voluntary readmission program. But if it is not possible to agree upon the distributing of a small number of refugees, how could it work out uh, in, in a few months' time? Well, if you read the agreement, uh, and I've just talked to the Turkish negotiators again three days ago, because now that the numbers have fallen so much, so fast, this one-on-one -on -one deal is not going to make any difference. And uh, just to, I mean, I can quote one of the leading Turkish negotiators who said, we knew that. We never thought this one and one is a good idea. This wasn't a Turkish idea. I still haven't figured out whether it was the Germans or the Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, but somebody thought of this one and one it's, it's a silly idea, but the Turks actually didn't need it. What the Turks want was to say, look, we will help you. We'll send a signal. We'll, dis we'll help defeat the business model of the smugglers. Then you help us with voluntary yes. resettlement. Now, the negotiations on this were held in what was called the Ankara Group, which was created earlier this year, which was led by Germany. And they met many times. The Commission was there, the Dutch were there, the EU presidency and the Turks. But it was always clear this would be a coalition of willing states. Here is the point. I think it it's always sounds great. And I understand. I, my instinct is to call for European solutions. It sounds rational. Sure. Let's get refugees, distribute them. But when it comes to something as sensitive as this, 
I think you need strong, democratically legitimated governments and leaders who can say, we will take people. This can't be done by Brussels or by majority voting. Yeah. There, I think, the Central mm. Europeans had a point. Not by resisting to take people, but by questioning whether this should be decided and imposed. I actually think it is much better to have it in a voluntary way. And I know this sounds irrational, but in fact, um, you, know, you can't Europeanize compassion. Angela Merkel, a Swedish prime minister, a Canadian prime minister, an Austrian chancellor can say, our people think it is the right thing to take people. We call on everybody else to help. But how and many here, refugees should be taken well, directly I mean, from the, Turkey? The discussions were, I mean, the, the numbers were, of course, mentioned in these talks. Mm. Um, the, as you might know, the Dutch have been public. They've said uh, between 150 and 250,000 people in a year would be real help for Turkey. I mean, this would be a substantial number. If it's spread out among a few countries, it's not that much. The German vice chancellor, Sigmar Gabriel, was quoted saying that you know, if Germany alone would take 200,000 people, uh, this would still be better than the chaos Germany had last year. So the thing is this. If now that the crisis is coming under some sort of control, countries like Austria, the Scandinavians, the Benelux, France even, and Germany, of course, say, look, we are willing to put together a package where we take 150, 200,000 mm. people from Turkey over a year because we want to show that we want control, but we are not going to build a fortress. And the people we are going to take, we know their identity. We know they are genuine refugees. We know, but this will be a coalition of the willing. Okay. And here's my guess. If we do it in this way, in a voluntary way, I mean, I had this conversation with Polish friends. They say, look, if we know these are refugees, if we know, they are, you know these are families, we know, we know their identity, we know they are not ISIS terrorists, and then we see the others do it too, will Poland really say we take nobody? I, I don't think so. Mm. I think sometimes, you know, I've read these experiments uh, that people are less willing to give blood when they are paid for it. Certain things you, you do also as nations or as societies because they're the right thing. You don't want to be forced. And in a strange way, I think a European policy that is set at the EU level on refugees will be less generous than this kind of peer pressure where some countries lead and then others feel like they don't want to be behind. But it must be combined with control. That's the key. Okay, let, let us see. Now let's start with the, with the session. Uh, Professor Landwehr, please. Uh, just a second. Uh, yes. It's delightful to listen to you, everything what you said. But perhaps one is more pessimistic if one looks at the general situation. I am the last person to uh, explain or defend the Hungarian prime minister's motives and actions. But 77% of the Hungarians supported this, according to really reliable poll institutes. The same in with Mr. Fizzo. He didn't get the heart attack because the people weren't supporting him. And uh, also, we see the same events in, che in Czech Republic, and Poland is worse today than even Hungary. What I want to say is, it's not just a question of imposing. Not, nobody will impose anything. It's basically a question that the situation is much worse. Mr. Orban is meeting today Chancellor Kohl. Whether he understands the word what he is saying, or whether Kohl understands the word what Orban tries to say in his not excellent English, it doesn't matter. It's an incredible political event. Mr. Seehofer, the Prime Minister of Bavaria, was in Hungary. So what I want to say, he not only not criticized, he's becoming a symbol for those people who are against this kind of policy. So this is number one. Number two, I don't know, with all the admiration I share for Angela Merkel, whether we don't overestimate our circles, our mood, our knowledge, and forgetting the people, and forgetting how easily, if you look at the Austrian presidential elections next Sunday and four weeks later, you see how easily people can be manipulated. That's number one. Number two, I agree 100% with the, what you said about the American activities and what Madeleine Albright did. But if you read the 
United States media, from New York Times to foreign affairs, national interest, you hardly find an article about the Balkans or Central Europe. And if you look at the situation in Macedonia these days, then you think that these figures you quote, they cheer up the politicians who don't really even know where Macedonia is and what they are talking about. This could change suddenly, because if you look at this front state, it is basically almost a failed state. So that's simply to say I agree with everything, but perhaps we should even press for more, and perhaps one should do something in the United States to launch an activity after the elections or during the election campaign to divert more attention to Europe because what's happening today, it really means that we have no American pillar of stability in Central Europe or Western Europe. Uh, I suggest we take a second question or remark. Uh, Ambassador Petric, please. Thank you so much. Um, I very much agree with uh, what uh, Paul Lendwey just said about the Balkans. I think this is really uh, a squandering of uh, the legacy of, uh, of the United States, what is happening there. And of course, the Europeans played a main role there, and it's not a very good one. But what I wanted to ask you, Madeline, is the following. Uh, now, you know the policy, the foreign policy of uh, the current president, the outgoing president, Obama. And I'm sure you have read the Atlantic uh, piece by uh, Jeff Goldberg about uh, the Obama doctrine, so to speak. Now, how do you see, and you know very well, of course, uh, the future president, the Xi that you mentioned. Uh, do, do you see a certain continuity, or is there going to be a change and a break with a very, how should I say, a very uh, uh, foreign policy uh, by Obama, who now really supports his non-decision in Syria, for example, with the red line issue, the way he rationalizes it, the way he explains it, which makes, of course, uh, eminent sense. But do you see, or what do you expect, rather, how the future U.S. foreign policy uh, will look like. Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. Let, me, let me just say the following, that how democracies make decisions in foreign policy. I, uh, I teach about this. Every country, it's an, an easy framework, which is there are five factors. Objective, which is where is the country, what is its resource base, Countries don't often change their geographical position. The Soviet Union did. Um, and the United States has a different objective factor. Some of it has to do with our uh, oil revolution. The second factor is subjective. How do the people feel? And there is no question that the American public is tired. There's just no question about it. And some of it does have to do with what I called the Karzai effect, and also that they're not, this sounds crazy, but occasionally it's kind of nice if somebody says thank you. Um, and the American, America is, I think, the most generous country in the world, but with a short attention span, uh, because we are needed in a variety of different places. And I, I really do think, I obviously travel around and talk about foreign policy a lot, and uh, their people are tired, there's just no question. Um, and wondering why we did the things that we did. The third factor has to do with how the government is organized, and in our case, executive legislative relations, and when two different parties control the government, uh, the, the way our Constitution is written, it is an invitation to struggle uh, just automatically, but basically there really have been people, like the Tea Party, uh, that have come in and have not wanted to have anything to do internationally. Um, and there, in America, there's always been kind of uh, some isolationist trend. So the combination of that with the tired. Then the fourth factor has to do um, with bureaucratic politics, which are reflected in what the budget looks like. And so, again, in our case, there was a, a big deficit as a result of many things, but one, the war in Iraq, and a real question about what the size of the domestic versus the foreign policy budget is. And finally, individuals. And that part I consider 
frankly, one of the more interesting parts. President Obama and Secretary Clinton, both senators at the time, ran against each other. Pres Senator Obama became president because he wanted to, on the basis of change and getting ending the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. What I find most interesting about our system is that, in fact, Secretary President Obama asked, or President-elect uh, Obama at the time, asked Secretary Clinton to be his, or Senator Clinton to be his Secretary of State. Very interesting, and a great sign of what coalition politics are about. From what I read in her book, and I read in his book, they did disagree about things. Syria was one of them. Um, I think that President Obama felt very strongly that um, the United States had made a mistake uh, by being in the Middle East the way it was. And also, um, he, had, he had a different view about the way the Pacific should be treated. I, I think that uh, what I know of Secretary Clinton, I think she helped to restore America's reputation after the war in Iraq. Uh, I think she is um, uh, definitely a globalist. She sees things, and she also looks at power in a different way. She talks a lot about smart power, which is a combination of um, diplomacy and assistance and the use of force. And I think she, having been a senator on the Armed Services Committee as well as Secretary of State, kind of looks at things from the perspective of American engagement. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I'm speculating here, but more involved internationally. Uh, in terms of seeing what America's role is. But again, a very important part of this, and I keep restating this, is partnership. The United States wants and needs partners because we do not want to run the world by ourselves. It is, it is just not in the American psyche. And so I think trying to find partners, uh, whether here or in um, Asia or in Latin America, I think is part of the gestalt that, that we have. And so I see her as acting in that way. Um, but I do think uh, one has to, to go back to my factors. President Obama came into office with a different view. There's no question. He was elected to end the wars. He did that. So, Yeah, Professor Landwehr uh, asked about uh, the lack of interest in the USA about Central Europe uh, and, and the Balkans, which can be seen in the lack of articles in, in newspaper like the, the New York Times. Well, I do think, uh, I, I, hate to, I, I hate to criticize my own country, especially when I'm abroad, but I do think that we do have a generosity and a short attention span. Uh, and I have been very troubled by things uh, that, um, and I go back to what I said before, I think we thought that this part of the world not only could take care of itself, but could be partners with us. Um, and, and I think there is a disappointment in it. I think that's part of it. The truth is that we do need to pay attention to Asia. China, I think the, the crucial relationship in the 21st century is the U.S.-Chinese relationship. And it's a the biggest, you know, huge country, huge population, certainly all of a sudden active in the South China Sea. Nobody else is worrying about that. Um, and so we do have responsibilities that are global, which is why we need Europe as a functioning partner. I think that that's the issue. I have to say that I wish we had done more in Syria. I used to say this. Um, my book, Prague Winter, came out just as this was going on. And I said that as a Czechoslovak, the fact that Neville Chamberlain and people could say, why should we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names? I said the same thing about Syria. We need to care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names. But that is the hard part, especially um, when there are those. Um, we also have our populists, as I said. So, yeah, yeah. Perhaps just one word on what Paul Lendweiss said. I think one thing that is striking, it is very clear that there is a big rearrangement in European politics. I mean, we see it in Germany, we see it in the Netherlands, we see it in Sweden. I mean, in many of these countries, parties doing very well in the polls challenge the consensus. So the question is how you engage with this. 
I mean, as long as you know what the front lines are, it's clear. The trouble that I have with Viktor Orban and some others, he's still a member of the European People's Party. I mean, he's still a member of a mainstream European center-right movement. And then he says things like, just two weeks ago, he said, it is forbidden to say it that in Brussels they are constructing schemes to transport foreigners here to destroy the nation state. But who is Brussels? Donald Tusk is the European People's Party. Mr. Juncker was the candidate of the European People's Party. Angela Merkel, who his, his nemesis, is the most prominent leader of one of the biggest members. So what I think is the problem, and in this situation, it's not just on the center right, it's on the center left too. With this new realignment, the mainstream political family, they, should have, they will have debates, how to control borders, what, how many refugees we can take. This is all normal. But when it comes to the kinds of hate politics, where you say, and he is proud, I will not have a single Muslim in my country if I want to. And Mr. Fizzo said similar things. There, I think, the European Socialist Group, the European People's Party needs to draw a line. So I really think that these attacks by Viktor Orban are against people in his own party, but he wants to stay inside because he thinks perhaps he can move the EPP or others in this direction. I think, I hope that with the refugee crisis coming under control, there will be a moment when the ÖVP and the CDU and other parties will say, look, this was a very nasty game you were playing. You didn't take anybody. Okay, you also made our job more difficult. You attacked us while Angela Merkel and others were trying to cope. You really have no place in the EPP. So, uh, no, of course, he says it in Hungary. This he says in, Hungar in Hungary, but as Madeleine Albright said, there's technology, and these speeches are in English <laughs> on a Hungarian website. And we have actually been reading his speeches for the last six months, and it is fascinating reading. Anybody who's interested, I send you his speeches. It's very frightening because they are so smart. He never attacks Angela Merkel by name. He just says that what she wants to do will destroy Europe, will destroy his Hungarian nation, and is equivalent to treason. But he likes her. <laughs> and this is the problem. You know, there, I think we need to do something. I think the mainstream political parties need to draw a line. Um, because if we, if we give in, mm. and I see it in France, I live in Paris, and I see it in France with the Front National, if this discourse becomes acceptable, then everything's lost. Okay. We've got at least two more questions, please. Yes. Uh, Madam Secretary, you briefly mentioned Ukraine. Could you give us your thoughts on a possible solution? <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, the second one, please. The, the lady, the third row. <laughs> Strangely enough, it goes along the same lines because you criticized Viktor Orban and it was well deserved, but I wonder what you think about another guy who ran through a significant transformation, namely Mr. Putin. Do you connect Putin's actions in Syria and in Ukraine? <laughs> And what is your take on contemporary Russia's foreign policy? Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> they definitely go together here. Let me just say, <laughs> let me go back to when I talked about the survey that I had done in 1991. We also were in Russia. And I will never forget a focus group right outside of Moscow where this man stands up and I'm so, he says the following, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. Um, and so there really was a loss in identity for the Russians, uh, and Putin has identified himself with that. He has now, you know, uh, takes off his shirt and uh, is very proud of being mucho macho. And, but he has identified with a real issue. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, in terms of, Russia's loss of identity, and um, and he is um, continues to be very popular, uh, and um, but I think a lot of his popularity depends on having an enemy. Uh, I also do think, and I'm often asked about him. I first met Putin um, in uh, when he was still um, acting president, and we were having an APEC meeting in New Zealand, and he wanted very much to be liked. Uh, to be, and he tried to ingratiate himself with President Clinton and the other leaders. Then we had a summit in uh, Russia in 2000. He's very smart, um, and um, 
you know, doesn't come with talking points and does takes his own notes and really very impressive in terms of being smart. I think that what he has done is uh, anybody that can say that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century somehow has forgotten what actually happened uh, in the century. Uh, and he operates on the basis of fiction, I think, uh, and he has around him pe himself people that help him in that particular way. I think his goal is to make Europe fall apart, <clears throat> to uh, push against the European Union and NATO uh, and do everything he can to divide us. Uh, and um, the actions that he has taken both in Ukraine and then also, I happen to believe that part of what he was doing in Syria was to divert, to divert attention from Ukraine uh, and then reinsert kind of Russia's role in the Middle East. Uh, and I'm very nervous about the kinds of things that he's doing vis-a-vis -vis Moldova and Georgia, some on the Baltics in terms of asymmetrical ways of uh, making life uh, difficult for the people, either with little green people or <coughs> cyber activities, and that he's just going to kind of keep pushing. I think he has played a very weak hand very well. Uh, I think that he is a good tacticianer, uh, but he's a KGB agent. Uh, and that is the way that he thinks. And I think that we, especially the kinds of things that are being talked about here, <coughs> have to be on guard not to fulfill his desire, which is to divide ourselves. Um, and so uh, uh, I think there are questions about how he's doing and the oil prices go through the five factors with me on him, <clears throat> and those are the issues. The Ukrainians, <clears throat> I have, uh, I've spent a lot of time in and on Ukraine. I feel sorry for the Ukrainian people. They have been let down by their leaders. Uh, whether it was with the Orange Revolution or then with Maidan, uh, and that their personal animosities have created difficulties for them. I think that I wish that um, we were more in a position to help the Ukrainians. Uh, I happen to believe that people have a right to defend themselves. Uh, and so um, some of the kind of diversion into other activities has made it difficult. The bottom line, however, is that there are issues of continued issues of corruption in Ukraine. Um, I think uh, they've just had another political crisis with Yasenyuk <coughs> being forced to resign and the relationship between him and Poroshenko generally. Uh, and they need time to recover. Uh, but they are continue to be under pressure, and the question is whether the Minsk Accords Anything is really happening on them. I do think <coughs> that it's very important, in addition to dealing with the refugee crisis, is that the sanctions be renewed. That what, is it, what um, Putin wants is to divide us. And then there is a genuine question that is in the papers <coughs> in the United States, is to what extent Putin is using the refugee crisis. Uh, there are articles about the militarization of the refugees, uh, because part of it is kind of getting everybody confused. What is he doing in Syria? Uh, why does he have uh, an association with uh, Bashar Assad? What is all that about? And at the same time, again, being the United States, we do have a responsibility to find some kind of potential relationships with everybody and try to find areas where we can work in cooperation with the Russians. Secretary Kerry did that on the chemical um, uh, agreement. So, uh, as I said, I loved representing the United States uh, as a, as a <clears throat> naturalized citizen. To sit behind the sign of the United States was my greatest honor, but it's not easy to be the United States. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's the issue, because as I said earlier, damned if you do, damned if you don't. We'd take, like to take two more <coughs> Oscar Brauner, please. Um, <clears throat> now that you talked about uh, Mr. Putin, um, his uh, allies, <coughs> excuse me, 
his allies uh, in deconstructing Euro by the right-wing populist parties right. all over. Uh, we're in a country where we might have a, a get, uh, be on the way of having one of those as president uh, shortly. Um, with uh, millions of people waiting to come to Europe in the Near East and other millions of people waiting to come to Europe from Africa and us wanting to help, how do we go about without uh, those right-wing uh, parties taking over Europe? I mean, <clears throat> I think that, um, first of all, let me just say that um, the level of difficulty across the world is just stunning. You think about various things that are going on. Um, I did, I've written a number of books, but one of them uh, was called Memo to the President-Elect, which is before I knew who the president was going to be. I ultimately did give it to Barack Obama, and I wrote in it with the audacity to hope that this book might be useful. <laughs> <coughs> but one of the things I looked at were what the kind of international issues that required international cooperation. Obviously, nuclear, <coughs> nuclear proliferation, climate change, etc. But one of them was the disparity between the rich and poor in the world. And um, there have always been differences, but it never was that the poor knew what the rich had. Uh, and so while there is no direct line between poverty and terrorism, uh, clearly if there are groups of people that are completely alienated by their societies, they are more likely to, you, to, to join groups of people that hate the establishment. Part of that is, uh, and terror, what happened in the United States, I think, to go back to one of your earlier questions, is we got into Iraq because of the fear factor. Uh, we haven't talked about the whole, uh, enough about the threat of terrorism and, and the effect of 9-11 on Americans and, and, and all that. But partially what's going on now has been the, the introduction of the fear factor uh, and that makes it very easy for demagogues to take advantage of it. And the question is how to calm down the population. Uh, and that, that is the hard part. Uh, but I think there really is this kind of thing that everybody that isn't exactly like all of us is to be afraid of. And, um, and I think that is an issue. The other that we have barely talked about, but there is a difference between refugees and migrants. And while it seems legalistic, um, refugees are those that are afraid of um, punishment for what they believe in um, and to be uh, terrorized by their state. And migrants are those who are trying to look for a better life in some way, the rich-poor uh, problem. And there are a lot more migrants than there are refugees, but it is hard to figure out especially when there are capabilities of movement, how to separate and what to do about it. But the right-wing parties, again, are opportunistic <coughs> in terms of taking advantage of the fear factor. And it's very important to push back against it, but hard, very hard, and also easy answers. I think, I mean, I have now talked for a while and mm. made things sound even more complicated than I wish, but everything really is hard. And so trying to explain to people that are more interested in our country in reality TV than in really understanding what the problems are, some slogan works much better. And I think that that's partially what's happening even within educated Europe. And so I am worried about it because, again, and it's what you said, opportunistic politicians are seeing uh, the fact that having the refugees and the problems makes their life simpler in terms of saying, I'll save you from those horrible people. If you may allow one last question uh, over there, please. Just to bring it all back to the United States um, for a minute and to um, our next president, um, Hillary Clinton has really been attacked uh, for her vote on the Iraq war and now for Libya and for other foreign policy decisions that she's made or been involved with. 
Um, and, and this has given Bernie Sanders a lot of um, juice and electricity, it seems to me. Um, do you have any thoughts about how she could allay these criticisms that she hasn't yet done? Well, that people <coughs> feel she's a hawk, a, a, a humanistic hawk. Well, she, having just been asked uh, what I thought about um, President Obama's interview, um, that um, there are those who think that he has not done enough. She is more forward-leaning uh, than he is. I mean, that is part of it. Um, and actually, the partnership that she had had with President Obama, in many ways, it's, it's interesting to go back and read her book and then to know she, she was more forward-leaning on things. I do think that what is interesting is to explain, and she has tried to, her vote on Iraq. Um, first of all, they're really, and it goes back again to um, our Constitution in terms of uh, what she, th she was doing in terms of supporting President Bush on Iraq was that he had said that he was going to the United Nations in order to get uh, international support for dealing with what um, we were all told was um, the uh, chemical weapons, the weapons of mass destruction problem. Uh, and let, can, if I might just interject here on the following thing. I was in office, uh, I was at the UN, and then as, as Secretary of State, after the Gulf War, and the ceasefire of the Gulf War had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. And the things that were supposed to happen were that there were international inspectors that were sent in to um, Iraq in order to make sure that the weapons were being dismantled. The truth is that the weapons inspectors dismantled more weapons than the Gulf War itself. But they were kicked out in 1998 before we had a full accounting if everything was gone. Um, and I myself doubted. We didn't know whether they had weapons of mass destruction. I actually thought that the sanctions resolution kept Saddam Hussein in a box. But there were questions about what was there. There also was what the Bush administration had said was that they were going to the UN. And then President Bush and his people didn't follow out the diplomatic string. That was the basis of, of her vote. And, but she has said that she made uh, a mistake, that she wishes that she had done something different. The Libya thing is much more complicated in terms of what we talked about, in terms of responsibility to protect. And it goes back to another story. And that is that everything takes much longer than we think. That issues are not solved. Libya is not over. Um, they are, there are some changes going on there now. Uh, and we are all very um, um, kind of impatient about everything. I happen to believe, and this is as good a way to end it as any, that there has never been anybody that's run for president that is more experienced than she is. Uh, in terms of her background, of um, things that she did as First Lady, where she was very clear about listening to people. Then, uh, as Senator, being on the Armed Services Committee, and then as Secretary of State. She also can do something that most of us can't do. Uh, I'm not bad at foreign policy. I'm not so good at health care. But the bottom line is she can do both foreign and domestic policy. And that is very rare. And so... There is an opportunity, but there is the very much this question in terms of um, how, I mean, she is under attack. There's no question. That's, what, that's what's going on in the campaign. When she defends herself, she is accused of being shrill. Uh, and um, I have been aware, let's go back to my interaction with General Powell. Um, same questions from a man. Uh, are not said to be patiently explained. And so I think that um, she, um, I think, has a hard time in terms of what tone to take, uh, what to wear, um, how she responds to people. Uh, I happen to believe that she will be a great president, but it is a very tough campaign. And the media have, in fact, I think, been complicit 
in, uh, because they want a horse race to kind of constantly keep um, saying that she didn't win by as much. She's gotten something like two million more votes than anybody else. Um, and so um, that's the story. Anyway, she will be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.